This video is brought to you by Sporlin, quality, integrity, and tradition. This morning we have a walk-in freezer that is not working. Now the walk-in freezer is right in here. And they're saying that it's like 23 degrees. Uh-oh. This guy is like... It sounds like it's bypassing or something, like it's an internal bypass. Um, the sight glass looks like it might be flashing but it's pretty beat up but that suction line's warm condenser fan motors are all running let's look at the shape of the condenser let's come on over here it could be that it's a dirty condenser and it's off on internal bypass oh yeah look at that condensers plugged that's not good well let's go get some service gauges so the freezer evaporators are running but the temps are high 22 degrees there's a little bit of frost on the coil i think what's been happening and i'm going to put gauges on it and we'll verify it but i think that during the day it goes off on high pressure and they're lucky they don't ruin their dang compressor doing that constantly on off they said this has been happening for a couple days where it'll work and then it stops they called me out here actually today on a water leak and they said they thought the water leak was it and I was like, no, that's not the problem. So, all right, well, let's go up top and put some gauges on this guy. All right. So it's hard to tell. The sight glass doesn't seem to be flashing, but this compressor is making a sound like it's bypassing. I can hear a hissing inside of it. The liquid injection is working. This compressor is ridiculously hot. As far as our pressures go, yeah, something's a little off, but it's not horrendous. So what we're gonna do, uh, but we've got oil in the compressor. Yeah, that is odd for sure. What we're gonna do is we're gonna shut this guy down. We're gonna clean that condenser because there's definitely something going on there. Um, you can also, I, I tempted to shut it down let the pressures in the compressor um, calm down then turn it back on but it's so hot I'm afraid it's probably going off on overload too so we're gonna clean the condenser by cleaning the condenser that's going to uh, um, allow everything to cool down inside the compressor and everything and then and then we'll start it up after it's been off for a little while when cleaning these guys, if you work on these Kyrak racks or Cool Tech, whoever makes it, Cool Tech I believe makes it, Kyrak just rebranded it, but um, you want to put the compressor covers on because the water will drip off and hit all the pressure controls and everything. So it's always best. You can leave the other covers off on the other side, but always put them on right here. Um, it's just that way when you're hosing and everything. So we're going to use uh, Viper Venom Pack Cleaner from Refrigeration Technologies. Uh, this is a highly concentrated cleaner. Use their foam gun. Minimal amount. That's going to be more than enough cleaner for this rack. I'm going to probably end up pouring some back in there. You don't add water or anything like that. So we're going to do a pre-rinse on the coil, get it cleaned off, then we'll apply the cleaner, clean it out, and then uh, hopefully start it up and hopefully this thing calms down. The pre-rinse is one of the most important things when you're doing coil cleaning. It doesn't matter what brand cleaner you're using. You always want to get the coil nice and wet. That way it has a clean, you know, somewhat clean lubricated surface. So that way the coil cleaner actually glides across and actually can penetrate and the foam can make its way through and everything. So I'm not just focusing, this is my condenser for the, for the uh, walk-in freezer, but I'm not just focusing on that. We're cleaning the whole rack. We're gonna clean everything, okay? So we can eliminate future service calls. Obviously being careful, um, using the wand really helps when you're doing these things. So again, we're just pre-rinsing and then we'll apply the cleaner in a few minutes. Now a lot of these condensers too are not in use anymore, but I don't remember which ones are, so it's not going to take that long just to clean them all real quick. Now this very well might take a couple passes, I think it's going to. I've got the first coating of cleaner on there, it's been sitting there for about a minute. I want to get it off because you don't want to leave it on too long. But you can see it's coming through all the way through, pretty bad, all the way down. So. I'm gonna do the first rinse. We're gonna get that rinsed out and then we'll probably apply another coating to see if we can get any more of that stuff off there. The 
So after the first rinse, still pretty dirty up in there. So yeah, it's definitely gonna take another one. I'm still rinsing the rest off, so. So you get up in here and it's looking a lot better, a lot better. Still got a couple things I need to get off back there. So I'm gonna give it another little rinse real quick, but we're doing really good. But that compressor is still piping hot over there, so we definitely need to let some water run over the compressor too. As you can see the steam just rising off of it. I'm pretty confident that thing's been going on and off on overload. I'm never gonna get this perfect. That thing is still steaming and I cooled it off. Um, but I cleaned out between the compressors, you know, just rinsed, there was a bunch of leaves and stuff. Letting everything kind of drip dry. I'm gonna start putting the rack back together. Um, also too, you wanna rinse everything down the roof further away so I'm rinsing all the nastiness over there so that way it doesn't dry up and you know speed up the process of getting sucked back up unfortunately with them being this close to these exhaust fans you know this is gonna be some grease in here too oh and see it looks like I still got some foam in there I need to get out got to make sure you really really get in here and get all this stuff out um, but yeah it's looking a lot better in there a lot better so I'm just in cleanup mode and getting ready to turn it back on now all right, when you're firing these back up, you wanna do it slowly, one breaker at a time. Now I turned the condenser fan motor breakers and nothing came on because they're on pressure controls. So you gotta get the compressors running to get them to come on. So we're gonna go one at a time and just slowly turn them on. Sounds like those are not starting. There goes one, another, There we go, we are running. As far as times go, let's go ahead and set those. Nine, nine. It's gonna go into a defrost soon, and that's fine because I think I still got a little bit of ice to get off that coil too. So, all right, we're gonna watch this guy operate for a bit and uh, see what it does. Compressor sounds a lot better. It doesn't sound like it's bypassing anymore. Um, we're gonna let it operate and see if this guy starts coming down to temp. Hopefully this compressor gets cooled off from that suction gas coming back. And like I said, we're still gonna check on the coil too. There was a little bit of frost on there. We'll make sure that's all gone when we're done. All right, this refrigeration rack has always had problems with the condenser getting dirty, but in my opinion, the condensers are slightly undersized too because we always have issues in the summertime with the walk-in freezer compressor. We actually had to add this evaporative cooler that literally just blows on the rack to help pre-cool it. Very inefficient, but it does the trick. Um, came over here and uh, this guy, look at this belt, and it's stuck in the motor pulley. And I tried to turn it on and the motor doesn't move. So we've got a bad motor. We need to get a new pulley on it. Uh, we need to drain this guy, clean it, get it running because as it's warming up, they really, really need this. Well, that ain't happening. The bearings are seized on this guy. I had to put Rust Buster on it to get it to break free. Definitely need a motor and a pulley. But this guy, when you try to spin it, the whole thing spins. So it's supposed to be spinning right there. So this thing's not worth putting bearings on. This thing's junker. All right, it's been running for a few minutes and something is happening here because my head pressure is starting to climb. I almost wonder if it's starting to pump down and the compressor sound is getting pretty loud. I wonder if it's pumping down and it has like too much refrigerant. Is this guy in a defrost? No, this guy's not in a defrost. So why is our suction pressure, I mean our, our head pressure getting so high on this guy that the head pressure is climbing like that? That's not good. Condenser fan motor didn't shut off. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Something is going on here. It's very interesting. It's been running for a few minutes. My evaporator pressure's not going too high. I was wondering if maybe someone opened the door or something and the load went up, no. But look at that head pressure climbing. That's very interesting, huh? It just satisfied. Very interesting. What is going on here? Huh. It's interesting that it's satisfied like that. Let's uh, let's go downstairs and have a look at the temp control. No, it did go into defrost after all. That's weird. 
the red lights on so it was odd because the red light wasn't on a second ago maybe it was and i didn't see straight so yeah that makes sense but still we're gonna let it run in defrost for a bit because uh, there was a little bit of frost on that coil so i'll actually increase the time let it finish its cycle and then we'll finish evaluating everything i think what i'm gonna do to be honest with you because we always have problems with this rack and the size in my opinion the size of the condenser um I'm gonna probably talk to the customer about the, taking this this circuit out of the rack, putting a condensing unit over here. We wouldn't have problems with it plugging up the condenser as much anymore if it was over here. Notice like this AC, this AC is not that dirty. You know, the ACs don't get dirty because they're far enough away from the exhaust equipment and stuff. So if I take this guy, it wouldn't be hard to come out the side, run a line right over here, build a little, mini rack right here with some four by fours and then uh, place a condensing unit right here and then we can start pulling out the rest there's only walk-in freezer walk-in cooler beer walk-in i think one or two other compressors that are actually working in this rack two of them at the end are not in use at all all right we let this guy run in a defrost for a little while melted off any of that frost that was on there um what i'm noticing now now that it's turned back on we got all the frost melted i'm looking at my gauges 287 PSIG and climbing, 287.8. It's about 77 degrees outside. Okay, so rough rule of thumb is, is that our head pressure, our saturation temperature shouldn't be any more than 30 degrees over ambient. That's not always accurate, okay, but that's rough. So this one right here, I don't know why that's flashing on there, but oh, I think I'm picking up a liquid line clamp because I'm hooked up elsewhere. But my saturation temperature is getting too high, 114 degrees. It shouldn't be that high, okay? So if you use your rough rule of thumb, 78, 88, 98 should be about 108 saturation temp, okay? But what we have going on here is the head pressure control valve is slightly bypassing, and it shouldn't be because we're well above the bypass pressure. So the head pressure control valve is slightly bypassing, and I'll take you over and show you right now. It's just slight, but it's enough, okay? So if we look right here, liquid line temp, that's the true liquid line temp going to the receiver, okay? That is 110 degrees, 100 and let's call it 111, okay? The discharge line temp right there is 191. And this right here should be equal to the liquid line temp. And the fact that it's lower indicates that it's bypassing at the head pressure control valve. So I've got three clamps on that head pressure control valve and liquid line temp and discharge two should be equal and they're not. So we are slightly bypassing in that head pressure control valve. Now this equipment is really beat down and uh, I'm not going to change the head pressure control valve. We are going into summer right now if anything, I'm just gonna pull the head pressure control valve out of the system. It's got contamination probably because of the dirty condenser constantly running with high head pressure, the oil in the system is probably junked. And uh, it's just slowly bypassing. So a mixture of the dirty condenser for a really long time makes the system overheat and then you get kind of carbon buildup in the system and usually it gets stuck in the head pressure control valve. And look, we're climbing. Our head pressure is just climbing and climbing and climbing. And uh, yeah, it, those two numbers should be equal. So we've got to recover the gas out of this guy. Let me go ahead and shut it down. All right, here, system G. When we come over here, get this guy off. All right, so you can see my temperature clamps right here. So um, basically discharge two and liquid should be equal and they weren't, okay? So this right here is bleeding through the valve and dumping into the liquid line and slightly bypassing the outlet of the condenser. It's slowly closing off the outlet, backing up the pressure, and they're trying to elevate the head pressure when it shouldn't. So we've got to bypass this guy. I'm currently waiting for someone to bring me an empty recovery cylinder because mine were both full. And while I'm doing that, I'm keeping busy. So I pre-made this flare using the Navac flaring tool. And then I swage this side. This goes on the top, okay, right there. It's gonna go like that. And then I pre-made this one, which is gonna go on the bottom, but I don't know how tall to make this one yet. Now we're gonna go back in, 
with uh, Parker Spoiling Catch All and See All, okay? Now I'm using flare and a male female on the sight glass, so that way they just couple together. It'll be super easy, um, and I'm just about done. I've sanded everything up. Again, I'm just trying to stay as busy as possible. I've got plenty of pipe, so that way I can bypass the head pressure control valve, and again, I'm not normally into bypassing them, but I'm still gonna talk them into taking this compressor out of this rack, so there's no point in replacing the valve. We're just gonna recover the charge, bypass the valve, because it's currently May 18th, and it's like 90 degrees this week and 100 degrees this weekend, and it's gonna be that way for the rest of the summer. So the head pressure control valve's not really gonna come into play, um, but even if it was, we will probably have a new condensing unit before we get that far, but we have to get them operational. So that's where we're at right now. All right, I got my tank. So to make the process easier, I used the compressor to pump all the refrigerant into the receiver and the condenser. And while it was pumping down, I opened this guy up. So it's already dumped a pound and some change. The compressor shut down. So now we can go ahead and hit start on this guy using large diameter hoses into there, large diameter hoses to the gauges, and then just quarter inch hoses right there. Now, if I have to, I'll put the recovery cylinder in water if I need to but we'll see, I don't know how hard this is gonna be. Remember too, we don't need to go back in with as much gas. There's a winter charge in the existing unit because it has a head pressure control valve. We're gonna use new gas and we'll just clear the sight glass and then be done with it. So we'll uh, get it going here, we're going good so far. We're at about seven pounds now, it's been about two minutes since I turned off the camera, so we're kicking butt. But this is what we're watching, the output pressure. 350 PSI, the machine's gonna like shut down at like, what is it, 500 PSI or something? I can't remember. So we just wanna watch it as it's climbing, making sure it doesn't get too high. But so far we're doing good, uh, eight pounds. So we're kicking butt. It's starting to climb, so I uh, went ahead and put the bucket, or put the refrigerant cylinder in the bucket. We're just running a water hose. We'll just let it run for a few minutes. You know, they make sub coolers and stuff. I really don't need those. This'll do just fine. When you use the sub coolers, one of the things is, is that it goes on the output between the output and the tank um, and it traps refrigerant. There's always refrigerant trapped in that hose right there. So I prefer not to uh, you know, have extra hoses right there if I need to because there's always gonna be leftover refrigerant in it. So water simply does the trick, just flowing water across it. We'll already start dropping. It's already dropping, so we'll be good to go. We are just about done with the recovery. Um, We've got a lot of trapped liquid in the receiver. Uh, I originally pulled out about 16 pounds. I think the full charge is like 18. But uh, we're frosting up at the bottom of the receiver. So I'm gonna take the torch to it real quick and just heat it up to try to boil off any refrigerant. Uh, it's just kind of trapped in there. So while it's recovering, just heating it up, warming it up. Be careful because that's the pressure relief device that I'm right next to. So we don't want to overheat that. We're just trying to boil out the refrigerant that's stuck in there. All right, we've got this guy all done. I ended up having to pull this 90 off because there was a big hole in it underneath this guy. So we need to basically just go from this into that and then this i will pinch off i'm not going to destroy all this just in case the, you know for some strange reason they have me put a head pressure control valve back into this so i need to braise this up right here and then make a connection from here to there
All right, we're all done up here. Now um, I've got someone else here helping me now. So we're going to put the dryer in. So we've got the dryer facing the right direction. See how one time accidentally we put the dryer face in the wrong direction. But we just need to turn it a little bit, but we'll be able to turn it once we get it all brazed in. So we got to braze this one. I pre-made that piece and then down below, we'll get those brazed in and then we can pull an evacuation. And we are currently uh, purging the system with nitrogen. So that way, uh, you know, we prevent any more carbon buildup from causing more problems. I'm already worried about the TXV over here. So what I ended up doing was isolating the low side and we're actually just going in through the high side um, and then coming out the receiver. So, all right. So you can see up here, all that we're doing, discharge is coming in and I'm leaving that stub there just in case we ever have to add the head pressure control valve back in. So it comes up, goes over, goes into the condenser, then comes out of the condenser. Uh, this is the liquid drain now, out of the condenser, down, all the way down here and then comes up right here into the receiver and then comes out, goes through the liquid dryer and runs downstairs. So we're just currently brazing that guy in. So it shouldn't be a problem. And then we'll tighten up the flares and then we've got a nice clean condenser now. So hopefully that'll get us through. You know what I mean, Vern? All right, it is not gonna be perfect because there was still refrigerant boiling out of that receiver. I think there's a little bit of oil in there too. But we went in and hooked up three vacuum hoses, suction, discharge, and liquid. I used a T and a blank off plate on my true blue hose to do that. So we're currently at 2,400 microns. We're gonna let it run for a little bit, start cleaning up our messes, and hopefully it'll be there soon. All right. Um, I don't know what I was talking about earlier. I'm not gonna put new gas in here. I'm reusing the old gas. So we're dumping in the old gas through the high side right now. Um, the, lick, the breaker's off, liquid line solenoid valve's probably, it's probably slowly leaking by somewhere. It's, but the low side's closed right now because we're just dumping in through the high side and the breaker's off and the solenoid valve's closed. So we've got about eight pounds in there. I think that's probably about enough to start it up. And then uh, we can finish charging. And all that we're gonna do because the head pressure control valve is bypassed is just clear the sight glass. So let's go over here, turn this guy on. G should be getting ready to turn on here in just a second. So it's got a digital thermostat downstairs. So the digital stat takes a second to turn on. And there we go. Looks like it just turned on. So it should kick in via the low pressure control here in just a second. And then we'll finish charging on the low side once it's up and running. Okay, now we are running. The compressor still has good oil in it, so we're just gonna let it run for a few minutes. The evaporator fan motor should not be running at the moment, so we gotta give them a few minutes and then they should turn on, and then we should start seeing some real refrigerant flow through the system. So I really appreciate how easy it is to see those sight glasses. So this one right now is flashing. And that's a Sporland C All sight glass. Super nice. So uh, it's flashing at the moment. We're gonna give it a few minutes, just make sure the evaporator fan motors are running and then we'll start clearing the side glass, adding refrigerant. All right, we are looking good so far, still running. Cold, cold suction coming back. Feels like DTC valve is not flowing right now. Um, side glass is just intermittently flashing and then going clear. Right now it's clear. I'm not gonna add any more gas. We're just gonna let it kind of stabilize out, make sure everything's good. I have someone going downstairs to make sure the evaporator fan motors are running at the moment, so. Right. Everything is good. Sight glass has been clear for a while. Box is coming down in temp. Um, inside here, looks good. Everything's repairable if we need to. So uh, that's pretty much it. I'm gonna put the cover back on. We clean the rack. All right, so. Yeah, about seven degrees, that's nice. They have water leaks on top, that's why that's there. I got up there and figured that out. Has nothing to do with this though. They got roof leaks. All right, well, they're good for now. We're gonna talk to them about replacing the condensing unit and that is it for today. All right, here is our failed head pressure control valve, okay? I went ahead and took a bandsaw and just cut the ends off to make it more manageable so I can hold it, okay? Now, this head pressure control valve is really um, simple, but a lot of people misunderstand how they work okay i have a couple different styles this is an lac valve okay 
That is the style of head pressure control valve. There's a couple other ones, uh, but this is the simplest of design. This is a standard one. This has a 210 PSI bypass pressure. So if the system pressure gets below, or the head pressure gets below 210 PSI, this valve starts to bypass to try to regulate the head pressure to maintain a pressure differential across the expansion valve. Okay, here's another style, but still just an LAC valve. This one has a dual uh, element in the top, so it has two different pressures. Uh, I believe it's 100 something PSI and 70 something PSI. If you cut the power head, or the if you clip the tip on the power head assembly right here that just has a gas charge in it, then it becomes the secondary one, okay? But this is a special style. Now, I have a cutaway right here of the basic operation of the valve. If you look at it, you have a power head assembly that has a gas charge in the top, and it's got uh, typically in the case of the failed one that we had it has 180 psi of pressure in the top pushing down on a pin you can see the pin right there and it's opposing the system pressure so you have a spring right here and then you have the system pressure pushing on the bottom of that seat and then you have the power head pressure opposing that okay now in the case of our valve, we're gonna open it up right now. Now I've already opened this and I already know what's going on inside the, the valve, okay? Um, if we open up the bottom, you'll see, this is just a bigger version of the cutaway I just showed you, okay? It's not really that difficult, it's not rocket science, okay? Inside here, you have a pin, right? Just like the pin that you see right in here, okay? That pin that rides and pushes on the seat right here, all right, now, one thing I'm gonna tell you is that this pin, when I pull it out, it's binding up. You can't hear it, but I can feel it's rough. It's not gliding smoothly inside of here, okay? It's, it's, it's binding up and every once in a while it actually gets stuck. So that's one of our problems. And if we look at this pin, there's actually, you can see wear on it. There's damage on it where it's been riding on the inside and then also there's damage inside here, okay? And it's very, very rough. It's not flowing smoothly in there, okay? The next thing is the power head assembly that has the gas charge in it, okay? This should have 180 PSI of pressure inside of it, and it, it's, it's, it doesn't have 180 PSI. I, I can move it too easily with my fingers. Something's going on there. So. I believe that between the pin right here that is binding up inside of here and this power head assembly right here, I think that is our problem. I did not find any contamination as in metal particles stuck inside the valve. I very carefully took it apart and usually you'll find like a little piece of metal when they're stuck bypassing. And this kind of makes sense because what I, I don't know if it came across in the video, but what I noticed was this thing went intermittently start to bypass and it wouldn't bypass right away once the system got stabilized and the pressure started to build up that's when it would bypass so it wasn't like there was a piece of metal stuck on the seat that just was allowing it to always bypass this was a slow process and it was just ever so slightly bypassing okay now if you look up inside of here there is what you can see like some metal contamination up in there. That's actually just from me cutting it with a bandsaw. Before I cut it with a bandsaw, I opened this thing up and I was actually very surprised there was nothing in there, just refrigeration oil. So I think that this valve failed due to the high system pressures because that condenser always gets plugged up. The customer doesn't do enough routine maintenance. They do routine maintenance, but not enough and we're constantly having to clean that condenser because of the placement of the rack next to the exhaust fans, and that's what caused our problem with this guy, okay? So a failing, not a completely failed, but a failing power head assembly and a damaged uh, rod right here, and internals of the valve are very rough. Something's going on inside of there. Something's gumming it up, not allowing it to move freely. There's just something going on inside of there, okay? So that's it on this guy. Uh, I always encourage you guys when you have failed parts, take them apart. You know, I took this valve out a specific way. I cut it out as much as I could and then just unsweat the bottom connection. So that way 
I could take it apart and analyze what caused this valve to fail. A lot of people think these things are the worst invention ever. There's really nothing difficult about the way that a head pressure control valve works. I mean, look at it, look at the internals. It's, it's really not a big deal. You've got a seat right here. I mean, it is not a difficult valve. It's, it's just a basic valve, nothing too crazy. They can start out where you think they're gonna be easy. I thought, you know what, just, a, I've done it so many times, I thought it was just gonna be a dirty condenser. Once I cleaned the condenser, I thought everything was gonna be good. But as you guys saw, it wasn't, okay? Now, I'm not a fan of bypassing the head pressure control valve, but in this situation, because I'm gonna be replacing the condensing unit, I didn't see the point in installing a new valve. It's May 20th, we're not gonna have those low ambient conditions uh, for another couple months. So in the meantime, I had to get the system operational. It was the easiest way. Simply recover the gas out of there, bypass the valve, but I didn't bypass it in a way that I couldn't reinstall the valve in case the customer wants to. You know, I could easily just put that valve back in if that's the decision they wanna make. I don't think they're gonna go that route because they're very okay typically with me pulling condensing units out of the rack and relocating them, you know, doing individual condensing units. It's just one of those things that this customer has to deal with this a lot. They have a lot of these restaurants across the US. They run into this problem quite a bit. So they understand. Okay. So when I'm going through here, um, you know, I'm very careful about how I'm working on these systems, always paying attention. It's really important that you're always paying attention and that you give the system time to stabilize out. This problem, had I just cleaned the condenser and turned it on, it was like, boom, it's coming down to temp. Okay, we're good to go. But as I watched it for a while and I let it run longer and longer, that's when I started to notice that it was slightly bypassing the head pressure control valve, okay? And it's really important to understand the operation of the valve because had I not understood the operation, I'd have been like, why is the head pressure getting so high, you know? I was able to just get in there with some temperature clamps and be like, boom, 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 hey, this valve is bypassing it's not supposed to be okay there's really nothing too crazy about the operation of these valves i'm going to put a link in the show notes to the tech document from spoilin on how these valves operate it's really not a difficult process and you guys saw my cutaway it, it, they're really not that hard it's just an lac valve okay so there'll be a link in the show notes of the video uh check it out and uh, that's pretty much it. I really appreciate you guys making it to the end. Thanks for coming along. Hopefully you guys got something from this video, maybe how not to do something. I don't know. You know, whatever you guys get from these, it's kind of crazy. I, I'm still blown away that you guys watch these videos. It's really neat. Let me know in the comments. I'm curious in the comments of this video, how long have you been watching my channel? I'm, I'm really curious. Uh, and you know, I'd also like to know, like, how did you find my channel? Was it a recommendation? Did you just stumble on it from YouTube? Let me know in the comments. I'd really appreciate it. Okay. If you guys are interested in supporting the channel, supporting these videos and helping me to continue this, you know, uh, thing that I have going on. Um, the easiest way to support this channel is simply just watch the videos from beginning to end. That's the easiest way, okay? There's a couple other ways too. If you wanna support the channel monetarily, there's links in the show notes for PayPal, Patreon, and YouTube channel memberships. Those are all ways that you guys can donate to the channel. Uh, another really easy way to help support the channel is by going to my website, hvacrvideos.com. We have merchandise available on the website. This hat is one of them. We also have some new styles of hat. I got flat bill hats. I've got dad, relax fit dad hats on the back. Um, there's t-shirts, sweatshirts, beanies, all kinds of cool stuff. So that's hvacrvideos.com. Also, if you guys are interested in purchasing any tools, check out truetechtools.com. I have an affiliate code set up with them. If you use my affiliate code or my offer code, big picture, one word, at checkout, there's a little spot for it, you get an 8% discount on whatever you're ordering. I should say, it, there's a few things that my discount code doesn't apply to, okay? There's a few items, but on majority of the items on their website, you get an 8% discount, and when you do use my offer code, I get a small commission from that purchase, okay? So that's another great way to help support the channel. I really, really appreciate y'all. Thank you so very much, and remember, leave me some feedback down in the comments, and uh, we will catch you on the next one.